Hi, my name's Kevin Hicks and welcome to our YouTube channel, The History Squad. Now in this part six of our Hundred Years War series, we're looking at the Siege of Calais, 1346, then over to 1347. Now if you've missed any of the previous episodes in our series, The Hundred Years War, you can find the playlist in the description. So without further delay, let's crack on. So, Siege of Calais, 4th of September 1346 to the 3rd of August 1347. Wow. Edward III invested so much into this. Over that period of time, he had 5,000 to 32,000 of his own troops in and around Calais. Plus, I think it was 20,000 Flemish troops came down. Then he had 24,000 sailors involved in the whole thing. And then the French... They invested 50,000 soldiers in this whole relief and the whole story. We don't actually know how many troops there were in the garrison. Yeah, but it was as soon as August the 28th uh, that the king, just after the Battle of Cressy, decided on Calais. Now, this is interesting because he could have gone for Paris. But he'd made a bit of a mistake. His troops had been allowed to burn, destroy, pillage all the way through Normandy. You just imagine if the king had have said, nope, we're going to look after the people. Because don't forget, he was half French. And many of the French people believed he had a very strong claim to the throne of France. But he'd blown it. So instead of going up to Paris and saying, look, I'm here, you know, I'm going to be a nice guy. He would have had to lay siege to it. And he would have been veering away from his supplies on the coast. And of course, he could invite encirclement by a French army. His other option was he could go straight north and link up with his Flemish allies who were freeing themselves up after, I think it was the siege of Bethune had collapsed. But I think he did the sensible thing. He went for Calais. He's going to open up a port that is close to England and it is going to be in his eyes, it's going to become part of England. And I think this is a master stroke because he's already, after the Battle of Cressy, he's short on supplies. Yeah, He's got to get all the way to the north. And the way he did it is quite fantastic. Now, I'm going to show you a map now of the route that he took to Calais. So here we have a map. It shows you England here and then Normandy. This is, you know, what we now know as France. And this top part here, Flanders. So, Edward III's army sets sail across, lands on the Carantan Peninsula, and then burns its way down to Caen, and then on from Caen down towards Paris. They cross the river there. They have a little bit of a to-do with the French king, if you remember, and then up Blanchetec, and then the Battle of Cressy just here, yeah, 26th of August, 1346. And within a couple of days of this, he's decided not to go for Paris, not to go and link up with his allies up in Flanders, but to go on to Calais, easily to be resupplied. And also, he's going to make that a little piece of England. So Edward III, with his army, arrives at Calais on the 4th of September 1346. And the garrison commander there, the first thing he does, that's Jean de Vienne. He shuts the gates. The siege has begun. Now, King Edward had enough troops to actually blockade the land side of Calais. He had allies from Flanders who would add to his force. So that isn't a real problem. His problem was the size of Calais and its access to the sea. Edward III, at this stage, did not have a strong enough navy to completely cut Calais off. And this is a problem, because he's already sent messages to England to bring all of the guns, all of the cannons from uh, the Tower of London. But these aren't powerful enough to bring down walls. But that's the other problem the king's got. He doesn't want to destroy Calais. He has got long-term plans for this town. So it's going to have to be done by starvation. Now I'm going to show you a plan of Calais and you'll understand the dilemma of Edward III. So 
here we have uh, a diagram from about, I think about 200 years after the original siege, but it shows you Calais quite plainly. This is Calais town. And here we have the citadel. Now, around Calais, there was an awful lot of marshland and sand dunes um, to the east. So we've got the north entrance here, south entrance, then the sand dunes to the east, and then all the way around here, you have sand dunes pretty much um, to the west. This is the Hem River, and this whole area was called the Haven. And there was room in there for dozens upon dozens, if not hundreds of ships. So you can see uh, Edward III, he had a big problem. He's got to invest the siege all the way around. He's got problems with the marsh ground, with different sand. And also the city, or you can see these bastions here, triangular jutting out uh, defences. There's one here on the actual town. Also, there was a double ditch. Uh, there's one on the outside, and then there's a wall. Then there's uh, another one, yeah, just here, and then there's the main walls. So he had an formidable defences to actually uh, attack and take. But of course, don't forget, he wants to keep all of this as a little piece of England. But just before I put the diagram away, this is important. It's the watchtower. So Jean de Vienne can actually see everything that's going on from all the way around. So they will be looking out constantly for a French army on its way to relieve them. So the siege is invested. Edward III now is settling down for a long term when all of a sudden Jean de Vienne, the garrison commander within Calais, expels 1,700 people. Old men, women, children, bouche nutile, empty mouths, useless mouths. Edward III has these people seized and he feeds them, waters them, sends them safely on their way. This king is, is really something because later on in the siege, when things are getting desperate for the French inside Calais, they expel a further 500 people, but the king doesn't allow them out. But this king, forward planning or what? He knows his troops are spread out in the sand dunes, in the marshes. They're going out on sorties around the countryside to gather supplies. So what does he do? He has his carpenters build a town out of wood, new town, yeah, new ville. He has it planned properly, so all roads lead to the market square. Would you believe that, a market square? Twice a week, a market is held under charter from the king. Local people can bring their wares and their supplies to sell at the market. Soldiers can go to the market, replace worn out shoes, all that kind of stuff. He's also got supplies constantly coming over from England. He's only just Calais to Dover, isn't it? It's great the way this whole thing is beginning to work. His troops are going to have comfort, yeah, in wooden town, this new town. But the king himself, he has a headquarters built within Newtown. So he is going to run the siege from his headquarters. And then problems in England, you know, things that have got to be sorted out, he can run from his headquarters. He is not going to skedaddle back to England, to the warm palaces. He's going to suffer the, the privations of his soldiers during this siege in that winter that is about to hit them. So the siege drags on through the harsh, cold winter. And then in April 1347, Calais is resupplied from the sea. 300 ships enter the haven offload their supplies and actually sail away, the English fleet appears to be helpless to stop them. And this is the problem now. I'm going to use my model now to show you what the problem was and how the king overcome it. So one of the problems uh, Edward III had in his siege of Calais was the French sailors. They knew the water and using smaller galleys and smaller ships loaded all the way up, they could actually just hug the coast. Yeah, and don't forget there was lots of marshland on the coast, sand dunes, so you couldn't amass an army there. They would, in the very shallow water, hug this coast 
and the English ship, so I've got my famous Thomas here, were so deep drafted in the sea that they couldn't get at these lighter ships, which could sail off into the haven unmolested. So what does the king do? He looks at the situation, and I think this is brilliant. Let's just move this little galley here, shall we? Because what he does is he builds, first of all, a fortress at the entrance to the haven. Uh, I think it's called the Risk Bank. And then he builds piers, or he has his carpenters and his engineers build piers out into the shallows. And what this does is it pushes the little French cargo ships out and away from the coast into the path of the English Navy. Calais is now sealed. So Edward now is in control of the sea. He has his pierce, his wrist bank uh, fortress, and he's doubled the size of his navy. He's put in some trusted generals on board some of the ships, so that allows his admiral, uh, Jean Montgomery, which the French pronounce Jean Montgomery. Yeah, I just thought you'd like that a little bit. But he brings over the Duke of Lancaster. Now, this is a formidable fighter, this nobleman, and he has sorties and forays out into the countryside as far down as St. Omer. So the French are being kept on their toes. But then the Earl of Northampton, with his little fleet, is right back down the coast of Normandy, away from the actual siege. He's intercepting uh, supply ships. But he seems to have caught a supply convoy. Now, I can only think that this is on its way back from Calais. It's either been turned around or, or whatever. And as they drive this little fleet of 40-odd ships towards the coast, they see one of them head straight for the beach to ground itself, beach itself. And they see the captain, they're so close up on here, and he's actually tying something to an axe. And he throws it overboard. And they mark the spot where the axe landed. And at low tide, those English sailors find the axe, complete with the note still attached. And it's from Jean de Vire from Calais to Philip VI of France. And it basically says this, help, we're starving. We've eaten everything, the horses, the dogs, the cats. What are we to eat now? Each other? Well, that message is transported very quickly to Edward III. He reads it, he now knows exactly what's happening in Calais town. But what does Edward do? He is so confident, he sends it on to Philip. Philip now has got to get moving. So Philip VI raises an army. French chroniclers at the time numbered it to 200,000, but modern scholars put it more like 50,000. But this Philip VI, he didn't like the foot soldiers and also the Genoese, after the debacle of the Battle of Cressy, have packed up and gone home. So his army is imbalanced. There's heavy cavalry mounted knights where it should be even. There should be infantry, the foot soldiers, as well as the cavalry. But Philip's army, top heavy with his knights. So Philip VI of France, with his army of 50,000 men, head north. They want to come around the top of Calais and hit it from the east. But that means going on to Flemish territory. So he asks permission and the permission is denied and he simply turns around and goes back. This is a king with 50,000 men at his back. We have no idea why but he comes back around the English army that's laying siege to Calais and he's going to attack from the west. His problem is he's bracketed by the sea to his left and marshland to his right. Four miles outside of all of this, he sets camp, and the people of Calais can actually see the king with his incredible army. So they light a beacon. On top of there, watched a great big beacon, and the French can see it in the night time. And then the next night, they light a smaller beacon, going, will you hurry up, kind of thing. And then the third night, they light a tiny little 
flickering flame. And then the most incredible thing happens. The French panic. 50,000 men simply set fire to their tents, abandon their stores and run away. The English pursue them. The Duke of Lancaster is there and many, many Frenchmen are slaughtered, captured and their stores surrounded and captured. We have absolutely no idea why the French ran away. We simply don't. But now Jean de Villiers has got no option but to surrender. So the terms are this. Bring the keys. I think it was six of the burghers, including uh, Jean, have got to come in their shirts, bareheaded, barefooted, with a rope halter as if they're going to be hanged. And they must then present it to the king. It was described as a solemn pageant. But this story isn't quite over yet. So the first siege of Cali is well over. And there is a kind of a, a postscript to this because uh, overnight, 1st and 2nd of January, 1350, there is an attempt by the French to recapture Calais by subterfuge. Geoffrey de Charnay. He is one of the commanders, a fierce French fighter, and he is the commander along the Flemish border there in northern France. And he's come up with an idea. He's got a spy network. And he has got somebody inside Calais who is willing to betray the English. He is uh, a uh, an Italian, a Merrick of Pavia. But what uh, Dushani doesn't realise is that um, this guy, this Italian guy, is a master of one of the most important galleys, the Thomas Galley, for the uh, King Edward III. And although he's going to pay him a fortune, he only paid him 20,000 French crowns, which is worth 10.7 million pounds today, so I understand. But what Deshani doesn't realise is the king knows the whole plan. And he, together with the Black Prince, sail incognito in disguise into Calais in December, and they wait for the plan to be sprung. But the French plan is quite something. They are going to bribe the Italian. Yeah, They're going to give him his bag of 20,000 crowns. He will open the drawbridge and the portcullis to the north part of town. Then a French contingent will creep through stealthily through Calais and they will open the drawbridge and portcullis to the south gate where there will be a French army under de Charnay waiting to attack. So that's the French plan. So let's see how it unfolds. First of all, the French contingent arrive at the North Gate. Yeah, Emmerich, our little Italian sailor, he receives his 20,000 crowns. They then enter the French contingent. They make their way stealthily. Well, actually they're stopped because what the English did was they built another wall and they'd also broken part of the drawbridge so that as the French come in they throw a boulder down and the actual drawbridge slams shut behind them. They're trapped. They can't get in, they can't get out. Now what happens is this, an English contingent go down to the south gate and they can see the French army. Can you imagine the surprise on Deshani's face when the drawbridge comes down and the portcullis comes up? An English bowman pour out and then English knights on their horses charge towards them. Arrows raining down, knights charging them. The French army, what does it do? It turns and it runs. But there is a pursuit and there is slaughter and many a man is captured. And the king is quite happy. And Amarek, he is actually paid a pension, £160 a year. But he will die later on because the French actually catch him and they behead him. But hey, this story just rolls on. So, thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed our little film on, was it part six of our Hundred Years War series, The Siege of Calais? If you have enjoyed it, 
thumbs up. If you're a subscriber, hey, thanks a million. We are so enjoying your comments and we're replying to them. It's great fun. If you're not a subscriber, hey, subscribe, ding that bell, join in, have some fun with history. But for now, thanks very much. Bye-bye.